In the beginning, the word was green. Just about everyone has seen the picture of the earth taken by the crew of Apollo 17 during their space journey to the moon. The photo shows a blue planet against the darkness of space. We are really shows, or we're really rather, a privileged generation to have this picture that we've probably all seen and associated with it an understanding of the great vastness of space. However, we're also the generation that is responsible for the untold damage that we have done to Earth's life systems, a system that has been almost five billion years in the making. And I heard yesterday that Australia has the worst record for the extinction of marsupials in the world. So in our time then, the collision between the Earth story and our human story is in need of some recognition and acknowledgement and reconciliation. I think we're all aware of the crisis that confronts Earth's community of life. In recent days, we've seen the pictures of dead fish in the Menindee Lakes in the Darling River Basin. We have seen floods in North Queensland where metres of water have fallen as rain in a few days. We have seen the pictures of drought in outback Queensland and New South Wales with its impact on farms and livelihoods and livestock. In the Judeo-Christian tradition, of course, the Genesis story was to go forth and have dominion over the earth, which of course now haunts us in the form of global warming, the threat of ecosystems and the loss of biodiversity, the depletion of energy resources, a deepening water crisis, international security flashpoints, crimes against humanity in Yemen and Syria, gross inequalities between and within countries, and poverty and destitution facing 1.2 billion people of the human population, which is now rushing towards 9, million, uh, 9 billion. Rather. And according to the demographers, we have reached the point of sustaining the, pro the planet Earth way back in 1986. If we ask the question then, how are Christians... How are we as Christians to love nature? And there have been a number of responses. There have been different approaches to the way Christians have loved nature. One of the ways expressed mainly in the Roman Catholic, Eastern Orthodox and in Anglicanism, and also including the voices of St. Augustine, Hildegard of Bingen, and the great Catholic poet, Gerard Manley Hopkins, who have reminded us, and using his words, the world is charged with the grandeur of God. This approach has been called the sacramental tradition and assumes that God is not only present in the hearing of the word and in the sharing of the Eucharist or Holy Communion, but also in each and every being of creation. Consider the lilies. A different approach has been called incarnationalism. This way allows us to love the natural world for its intrinsic worth, to love it in all of its differences and detail, in itself and for itself. And this approach, of course, was firstly expressed by St Francis of Assisi, in his praise of the sun and the moon, the earth and the water, as brothers and sisters. They were valued not only for what they gave him, but for how they were signs of God's presence and glory. 
the theologians who developed further this intuitive insight, spoke of seeing God's footprint in all creation. God is not only revealed in Scripture, but also in the book of creation. Humankind is part of this complex web, this complex web or relationship, and in caring for creation, we are therefore sharing in God's work. Another insight from the early Franciscans was that the variety in creation was not just an accident. The uniqueness of each element in creation speaks directly of God's loving presence and each species by being what the divine presence has made them to be and when each species is diminished, when it is abused by humankind, then the divine presence is diminished. Consider the lilies. But there's a modern concern now. Rising sea levels, deforestation, increasing pollution and decreasing flow in our rivers, dumping of our waste material. These are not just concerns for greenies or health or agricultural departments of government, but are fundamentally related to the issue of justice. Justice here means much more than simply deciding between right and wrong. It touches on living in such a way that God's righteousness is seen and proclaimed in all of our relationships, both human, animal and plants. Much pollution is caused by developed or developing nations, but the effects are often felt more directly by those who lack the resources to manage the damage to their fisheries, farms or forests. How then can we be true to our faith or to the God who asks us to live righteously when we participate in that which deprives others of their livelihood or food or the very substance of their living and being? Let me give you an example. Seen in the nation of Kiribati, a small nation in the Pacific Ocean. It is a collection of atolls and coral reefs, mostly more than, no more than two metres above sea level and home to 11,000 people. Rising sea levels and increased storms do more than just reduce the available land for them to live on. Salt water contaminates groundwater, damaged reefs no longer block storms as they did previously, and fragile coastal areas become yet more eroded, and food supplies are compromised. Their very existence as a nation is under threat. So one of the problems as to why the world of nature has dropped out of the purview of faith is that nature no longer forms the environment of the average person. Here in Australia, most of us live in cities. Melbourne and Sydney alone account for nearly 10 million people of our 25 million. And we've seen recently in letters to newspapers about the plight of our dairy farmers. We go along to the supermarket to buy milk, hopefully at the cheapest price, and we don't give too much thought to the struggling dairy farmer who works all hours to get it to us. And yet the Bible and Christian tradition have some vital and important insights into care of what the world terms the environment, but which the church understands as God's creation. Approaching environmental concerns through Christian lenses offers valuable ethical and spiritual dimensions that may contribute to the environmental work both within and outside the church. My own view is that I think a theological view of nature entailed for many Christians an acceptance of the biblical understandings of nature, especially the ostensible account of origins in the stories of creation in the book of Genesis. And as advancing scientific knowledge made this more and more difficult for us to accept, 
faith found itself in a dilemma. Either we could assert the veracity of the biblical account of creation in the face of all the scientific evidence to the contrary, or it could simply dismiss nature altogether and concentrate on the relations of God to human beings, which is what the church has done. Or as Augustine has said centuries earlier, God and the soul. Our faith's concern with nature and caring for our world simply dropped off the radar. However, the concentration of faith in the God-human relationship was that the world of nature was written off as outside the scope and concern of faith and was handed over to science. Now, of course, if I want to learn about the age and origin of the earth, I go to geology and not to the first two chapters of Genesis. I even commenced a diploma of geology at the School of Mines in Ballarat when I was teaching at Sebastopol Technical School because I was so interested in Earth's history. And so often environmental issues are dealt with in the political sphere in the context of fear and threat. We're warned that if we do A, then Z will be the consequence. And yet for those of us of faith, the starting point for caring for the Earth is as a proper response to the loving, creating God. Caring for creation is a key Christian task and action. So a question for us to consider. What is our role as followers of the way of Jesus in the created order? Is humankind intended to be separate from and have dominion over all creation? Or is our role to be part of the restoration, renewal and completion of God's original purpose in creation? However, there are two aspects that I think in the new faith impinges on our response. First is, according to Sally McFade, distinguished theologian in residence at the Vancouver School of Theology in British Columbia, in her book, A New Climate for Theology, God, the World and Global Warming, says this, it's how we think about God. There is the deistic view of God. This view arose in the 17th scientific 17th century during the scientific revolution. God is the clockwinder who winds up the universe by creating its laws and then sets it free to run by itself. And that God only intervenes occasionally in natural disasters, accidents and personal crises. God is the mechanic who keeps things rolling. Such people, of course, as Isaac Newton held such a view of God. And the second view of God is the dialogic view. God speaks and we respond. And this has been the central view within Protestantism uh, down through the centuries. The relation between God and the world is narrowed to God and the individual. And writings by Soren Kierkegaard and Rudolf Bultmann reflect this view. Another view is that God is assumed to be an agent. God is actor and doer, creator and redeemer of the world as well as its providential caretaker. And a problem with this approach is that a serious view of the world is lacking. The focus is on God and God's intentions for creation and how the divine will conceives, creates and saves and brings to fulfilment everything that is. And this is where the Earth Charter of the United Nations document that emerged from a decade-long worldwide cross-cultural conversation about common goals and shared values is a good corrective to that emphasis on God. It includes 16 major principles, the first one being the most important. This is what it says. Respect earth and life in all of its diversity. Recognise that all beings are interdependent and every form of life has value regardless of its worth to human beings. Affirm faith in the inherent dignity of all human beings and the intellectual, artistic, ethical and spiritual dimension of all humanity. I reckon that statement could have been written by you guys at St Michael's. 
Sally McFay introduces a new idea that we view the world as God's body. If God is always with us and we are in God, then it follows that the world is God's body. And in this view, there is no separation between the world as matter and God as spirit. Rather, there is a continuity between God and the world. And this view encourages us to think about our neighbourhood. Creation is not just about God's power, but about God's love. How we can live together, all of us, in God's body. We can meet God in the world and especially in the flesh of the world, in feeding the hungry, healing the sick, being conscious of the resources we use and reducing greenhouse gases. Nothing is too lowly to help our planet flourish. We find God in caring for the garden, in caring for the rivers, in planting trees, in loving the earth well, And this becomes our calling, our vocation, our central vision as followers of the way of Jesus. Climate change then becomes not only a political issue, but a major concern for Christians. Consider the lilies. There is an intrinsic value in each and every creature, plant, flower and planetary process. So let us consider the lilies. And so let us join in singing, oh, sorry, the blessing. Get ahead of myself. So today, may we be the solution and not the problem, the beginning and not the end the salvation and deliverance, and not the destruction. May we be salt and light of the world. Amen.